Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Gessel, and I'm the Director of Public Programs at Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. MOAD is a contemporary art museum, and our exhibitions and programming inspire learning through the global lens of the African diaspora. As many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose land we are located. With deep respect, Moad acknowledges that even in virtual space, we reside on unceded native lands and thank the Ramatush and Chochenyo Ohlone peoples of the Bay Area who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Learn more about the native lands you occupy at nativeland.ca. I welcome you this afternoon to the program series, African Diaspora Film Club, occurring monthly with Cornelius Moore, who is co-director of California Newsreel, the 53-year-old social issue nonprofit film distribution and production company. He is also an independent film curator specializing in works from and about the black world. I also wanna thank Black Public Media for co-sponsoring the series and their new season of Afropap the Ultimate Cultural Exchange is premiering tomorrow, April 4th, and I'll put a link to that in the chat. Today, we're thrilled to discuss the documentary, We Like It Like That, The Story of Latin Boogaloo. If you haven't seen the film, it's currently streaming on PBS's America Reframed, and it's also available on Canopy and to rent on Amazon, Apple, Vudu, and Real House. And we are so thrilled to have joining us for the discussion, writer and director, Matthew Ramirez Warren. Matthew Ramirez Warren is a documentary filmmaker and journalist born and raised in New York City and now living in Oakland, California. His work has been featured on PBS, National Geographic, and the New York Times. He was awarded grants from the National Endowment for the Arts and New York State Council of the Arts for his feature length documentary directorial debut, We Like It Like That. This film made Rolling Stone's 15 must-see movies at the South by Southwest Film Festival in 2015 and NBC's 10 must-see Latino and Latin American films of 2015 list and won Best Documentary at the Urban World Film Festival. Matthew directed and produced Eddie Palmieri, A Revolution on Harlem River Drive, an episode for the Red Bull TV documentary series, The Note, and Field produced several segments for the National Geographic documentary series, Chain of Command, covering international migration through the Darien jungle in Colombia and Panama, and ISIS recruitment among Trinidad and Tobago's Muslim community. His latest directorial effort, Weed Dreams, is a feature-length documentary currently in post-production about Oakland's first-of-its-kind cannabis equity program, for which he was awarded a Berkeley Film Foundation grant, a Miller Packin Documentary Film Fund grant, and an SF Film Documentary Film Fund grant. We'll start the discussion with Cornelius and Matthew, and we encourage everyone to participate by making comments and sharing reactions in the chat and submitting questions through the Q&A box. And finally, please take a moment to type where you're joining us from in the chat, because we love finding the diaspora in our audience. Thank you, uh, Cornelius and Matthew. I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the introduction. And for the people who are Muslims, this is um, Ramadan, so Ramadan Mubarak to everybody. Thank you, Matthew, for thank coming. You. And thank you for making this film. It's fun. Uh, I, I really enjoy watching it. And I saw it years ago. Uh, I am, I was around <laughs> when, when Boogaloo music came in, I remember it as a dance first. So you weren't, I'm just guessing, I think you probably weren't. So what what was your connection? Why did you uh, want to tell this story? Um, well, I grew up in New York City. Uh, my mother's from Colombia. So I always had Latin music in my life. You know, uh, I would hear it in the streets. I would of course hear it, at, you know, when I would be with my Colombian family, uh, and of course, going down to Colombia, would definitely hear a lot of Latin music. But I didn't fully understand Latin music's connection to New York mm -hmm. until I got a little older and I started collecting records. And I was DJing in college, and you know, just just doing the whole record collecting thing. And I started to find these old salsa records, and of course, eventually the, the Boogaloo records. And I would read them, you know, read the back. And I was like, man, this is like real New York stuff here. 
And I started to kind of dig into the history and really come to understand that New York played such a pivotal role in Latin music history and in the development of salsa. Um, and I started to appreciate all of that. But it, it was there was something that drew me to these Boogaloo records, these Latin soul Boogaloo records that was, you know, just intrigued me. They were half in English, half in Spanish. And they just sounded like tough. There was some, you know, they were fun, they were party music, but there was something real New York about it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I just kind of identified with it and gravitated uh, towards it. And I wanted to learn more. Um, and I started working in journalism and was doing sort of, you know, work in the news business and as a sort of side thing that would kind of bring me some joy away from all the dark, depressing news stuff, I would do music journalism. Um, and I started writing for a magazine, uh, which still exists. Uh, they actually recently relaunched called Wax Poetics. Um, and it was sort of like the Bible for DJs, producers, record heads, people that were looking back at older forms of music to inform uh, contemporary tastes, I suppose. Um, and I wrote an article for them about Johnny Colon. Uh, who I was able to track down through an earlier article that had been written about him. And uh, we met, spent some time with him. And after I did the story, I said, you know, this is a good story. Like you know, the whole concept's good. Let me see who else I can find from, you know, just looking at my record collection, looking at these albums that you see behind me, you know, and being like, I wonder how many of these folks are still around. Mm. And lo and behold, one, you know, one person led to another. And uh it, it, it sort of evolved in, into becoming what, what eventually turned out to be We Like It Like That. But that, that was one of my questions. How did you manage to find all these folks? Because this was more than 50 years, right? Mm -hmm. Since uh, Boogaloo came out. Yeah, it was, you know, it, 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 it kind of just, it started slow. Um, and, you know, you, you connect with older musicians. You'll find, you know, sometimes they, they harbor a certain bitterness or, you know, they, they didn't always have the best experience in the music industry. Um, so there was there was a challenge there to get people to trust me. But once once I got a few of them to trust me, they say, oh, yeah, I got so and so's number. You want to talk to him? I'll put you in touch. And that was sort of how it snowballed. I mean, there were a few. These are like, you know, social media was around. There were a few people who had social media pages or like their their son had set up a social media page for some for them. That was often the case. Um, so I, I did a whole Florida trip that had started from just contacting Joey Pastrana's Facebook page and his son got back to me and was like, oh, like you're interested in talking to my dad. And, uh, then through that met Harvey Avern, Richie Ray. Um, then I met Bobby Marine. And when I met Bobby Marine, he put me in touch with a whole bunch of people. Harvey put me in touch with Larry Harlow. So everybody was sort of open you know, once, once they saw like, hey, this, you know, this guy doesn't seem like he has any bad intentions here. He's just trying to tell the story. Uh, it, it, you know, it was, it was really cool. It was really cool having the opportunity to, uh, to meet people. It took a few years, but um, honestly, most, most of the people I connected with were very, ultimately very generous with their time. I won't, I won't badmouth anyone who wasn't. <laughs> I'm gonna keep that one to myself. But uh, every, everyone I, I spoke to and everyone you see in the film were, were really cool. And uh, I'm forever grateful to them for sharing their time with me. So um, have, this seems to be kind of a renaissance um, of uh, Boogaloo music. In fact, last week I was walking down Mission Street in San Francisco and, and um, somebody was blaring from like people doing the mission from the car, uh, bang, bang. You know, uh, and I was like, I, I mean, part of me is that I was dreaming, wait a minute, I'm going to do this program in a week. Is I mean, did they do it just, they knew I was coming, did they do it? Um, but is there is there a kind of renaissance? And has that also um, helped the people in the film and their careers and rejuvenate their careers? Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, even in the film, we talk about how, you know, in like the, two decades or so basically after the turn of the millennium how there was this sort of resurgence in interest that really started with you know sort of similar trajectory to how I was drawn to it with people who were DJing and people who were into the old records and I think a lot of folks from 
my generation, you know, I'm, I'm about to turn 40, so I'm not a kid anymore either, but for my generation, um, you know, we were informed by older music through our love of hip hop and sort of sampling and understanding like, oh, all these like golden era hip hop songs are actually samples. And then the samples get you started looking at the records. And then, and then you, you know, you find these like sort of soul funk, because a lot of the samples were soul funk or jazz, mm-hmm. let's say, and then you find these sort of soul funk adjacent genres, mm-hmm. like, like the Latin funk, Latin soul, Latin boogaloo, or from other countries, you've got Afrobeat, um, all, all sorts of genres that work really well if you're like DJing a funk set and you want to mix it up a little bit and drop like a conga break and you know mm-hmm. like it just it worked really well so I think that sort of started the trend and you you had compilations coming out in the early 2000s or you know definitely by like the you know 20 yeah definitely early mid 2000s uh you had these comps coming out and I think people in a lot of other countries really started to take to it too it wasn't it, it had really moved beyond just that New York core northeast audience i mean there there was a movement in south america like a lot of these guys brought the music to south america at the Mm -hmm. time and there are actually a bunch of amazing like peruvian colombian all you know different countries put out their own boogaloo music which Mm -hmm. you can find out about which we didn't really get too much into in the film because we wanted to kind of focus on the new york stuff which was sort of the root of it all um but yeah there was this initial resurgence among djs producers people record heads and then a bunch of bands started popping up Mm. and then doing their interpretation of it or putting the sound into their music and then yeah you have people like cardi b come Mm. out sample it um it was this sound that like never really went away like all these songs like bang bang i like it like that they would have like these resurgent moments throughout the years even prior to what i'm talking about Mm. um but i think nobody had like contextualized it or really understood Mm -hmm. it was just like Oh, there's an oldie, like right. you know, just like La Bamba is an oldie. Right. It's in right. Spanish, but it's like it just people didn't really understand what what this was all about. So I'd like to think the film contributed just a little mm-hmm. bit <laughs> into mm-hmm. into at least with some of these artists, you know, getting them to the older artists. Um, after the film came out, you know, we were able to do quite a few amazing events um, that were sort of in conjunction with the film. And we had people like Richie Ray, Pete Rodriguez, Joe Batam performing together, like at Lincoln Center. And some, you know, Joe had been playing, but some of the other guys really, like Pete, nobody, we were the first ones to find Pete in 40 years. Um, and he hadn't played in forever. Uh, so that that was like really, really special and nice to see. Um, but, well, yeah, yeah go, ahead. go ahead. No, no, I was going to say that um, I reached out to a younger cousin who's like, about, you know, early 30s and you know i asked him did he listen to cardi b and he's like why are you asking about cardi b and i said well i'm doing this program with um about um boogaloo music and and she and um bad bunny did this i I like it like that and he says yeah i love that song and i said well uh, let me turn you on to the original Mm -hmm. which he probably didn't know so um which I think the original, I'm you know I'm biased. I think that was yeah. that, that moved me more um, yeah. than, and so you know hopefully that that will that will that will indeed happen, um, you know with with that interest in the in the music, I mean the contemporary music. And then there was there was a movie, right? I like yeah. it like that. It yeah. came out about twenty years ago, and yes, so there there maybe that then people also got interested in, in hearing the music and wondering where it came from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, Tito Nieves put out, I believe it was, yeah. Oh my, if I'm saying that, if I have the wrong person, that, but, but yeah, it was, it was one of these big like uh, 90s salsa artists who put that mm-hmm. out. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. Yeah, was, well, yeah. Well, many, many of the people you interview, uh, including Felipe Luciano, uh, talk about how you know being in, in Spanish Harlem or East Harlem or New York that this the the Bugala music beca- uh, helped them form their identity because they had been listening to soul music and Motown and that sort of, that was their that was their, that, those were their jams 
and then the, but with Boogaloo, it's like, okay, well, this sort of helps me probably as a Puerto Rican become, um, have identity and, and have popular music and the like. And, and that went on for a few years. So I'm so curious. I come from another perspective because I grew up in a Black American community and there were hardly, you know, there were some Puerto Ricans in the town that I grew up in. Not, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't New York. Mm-hmm. And so this, this was the entry point for me, actually, sort of being kind of interested in Latin music. Did you ever talk to any folk who, Black people, Black Americans, who maybe had that that same kind of um, trajectory that I had? Um, well, someone who comes to mind that was in the film, but only briefly, you know, because you end up interviewing so many people and then you realize, okay, I got to, you know, figure out my core story here. But it was uh, Henry Pucho Brown. Uh, from Pucho, Pucho and his Latin soul band, I believe, uh, was the group, um, and and he he's African American, grew up in Harlem, uh, you know, grew up going to Apollo, and um, and he talked about Latin music, and what I kind of came to understand was, at least in New York, and I think other parts of the Northeast for sure, there was sort of this long-standing cultural exchange that predated Boogaloo, went back to the Mambo era of the, the like late 40s and 50s with, you know, like the original big three, like Tito Puente um, and, and, and those folks um, where they would have like an, Af- apparently the Palladium had an African-American night. They had a Jewish night, an African-American night and a Latino night, but it was always Mambo, Latin music uh-huh. playing. Um, and then even when Richie Ray tells the story about how he first heard of the Boogaloo dance and associated it with Latin music was because he was playing uh, um, a guaguancó, I believe it was, and, and, uh, and some these two Black guys started dancing a new dance that he'd never seen to what he was playing, to the Latin music he was playing. And they, he went and talked to them after, and they said, oh, it reminds us of, of, of you know, something we would do the Boogaloo to. It has a similar chord structure. Um, so I think, I think there was this kind of like a cult, constant cultural exchange happening in places like New York, um, and you know, and I think in in other parts of the country too, because there's a whole Chicano soul movement that I've come to learn about. Um, so there was this this exchange between um, you know young black folks, young Latino folks. Um, I think that was like a constant constant thing happening over the years. Well, the Chicano, still does. The yeah. Chicano soul, I mean, I think that still goes on. Sort of yeah. Like, uh, but yeah. it was, but it was, yeah, I mean, it, I don't think it, 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 the, as far as the music I did, it didn't become Mexican. It, it was like, it was the soul music and, and the Chicanos singing the soul music, you know, yeah. and having, having their own sort of style. Yeah. Uh, and dress and everything and you know with the low riders and all that yeah. which i you know that was interesting that you mentioned yeah. that because when i came to california because on the east coast i was like i, I would ask you kind of why <laughs> what what's this what's this romance with with soul music you know and they were like oh you know we just like the music it wasn't like it wasn't like a deep kind of um philosophical or any kind of academic thing it was yeah. that you know it was romantic good music, music. We, we liked it yeah good music's good music <laughs> the end of the day. so say say more about because your film is so is very centered in new york say more about what you found out about how if it existed other places i mean i did say i'm filiary and i and i mm-hmm. and i you know learned it from there but did was it really a really cent- centrally New York phenomenon or did, uh, how much on the East Coast did it go or other places? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I definitely remember the artist talking about going to places like Philly to play um, kind of all up and down the Northeast. Um, it wasn't till, and then of course, also going down to South America, like some of the acts who had really bigger hits, like I like Pete, Pete Rodriguez with I Like It Like That and um, some of the other artists. They talked about going down in South America and how this was a, a big craze. And I've come to find it's still like pretty big in, in, in Colombia, like where my mother's from. Um, they have a whole culture around it in Cali where they put the records on, like play them on 45 sped up and they have like a dance to that that they do. Um, so it, it, it did spread around. Um, 
as far as the West Coast, I know a few of the artists came to the West Coast. It seemed the ones who would make it to the West Coast tended to be the more soul leaning. Mm -hmm. So there is like Latin Boogaloo was kind of like the initial sort of sound and then Latin soul sort of sprung up out of that, I would say. And there is a little bit of a, like Joe, uh, Joe Batan always likes to say, I do Latin soul. Like mm -hmm. I did Boogaloo, but I really do Latin soul. Um, and those artists I found made it more out to the West Coast. Um, mm -hmm. I think because of the, the love from the Chicano community, um, mm -hmm. Joe talks about that a lot actually, mm -hmm. um, how he was really embraced by folks um, out here in California. Mm -hmm. Great, great. And I don't, I don't know if there's a Filipino connection too, because of the large Filipino he, population in the, in yeah, the Bay Area. He, he only told me that that was a later discovery um kind of in his his uh his kind of his comeback when he he started performing again in the 2000s that became a much bigger part of his audience mm -hmm. um, but at the time people honestly just thought he was puerto rican <laughs> <laughs> right right uh, yeah just like thought he was afro latino and, and yeah he, he it's such an interesting story like his story having grown up in spanish harlem being half black half filipino but just where because of where he lived right in El Barrio and you know he he ran with the gangs and like the kids from that area and you know apparently he was he was a he was a tough dude at the time uh well well respected in the hood as they would say <laughs> right. um, and he all, he'll always tell you that so I, <laughs> I never wanted to you know get on his bad side are you want to try it okay test it right okay. no <laughs> no he still likes me to this day that's one thing i'm happy nobody you know everybody everybody uh supported continue to and continues to support so mm -hmm. that to me is always a good test when you make a film you know that your subjects don't hate you <laughs> so it's interesting you mentioned that columbia connection because i invited a colleague friend who does a um, afro uh colombian film festival in uh, mm -hmm. medellin to come to attend today mm -hmm. and i not without knowing <laughs> that there that there um is that connection you know yeah. so um is, is the film um distributed in south america uh i we've had some challenges with our south american distribution so it's available in some countries not in, in others um but to sort of alleviate that issue i made it available on vimeo with spanish subtitles which don't tell my distributor. Okay. Okay. Because <laughs> right. um, I got tired of people asking me, like, oh, I can't get the Spanish subtitles. So I said, you know what? I'm going to make this available. It's not, it's not out there, mm -hmm. out there, but folks who, who, who know can find it. Just go to our Facebook page. There's a link there. Okay. Great. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so I'm intrigued about the concert at the end of the film. And that's, that's a central part, right? Mm hmm. So, What's the relationship of the film to that? Did you know about that was going to happen? Did the film kind of help generate that, yeah. that event? Yeah, um, I mean, that was a very kind of pivotal event for, for the process of making the film. Um, early on, I started working on this in 2010. And kind of early on, I did this, this flurry of interviews and I put sort of a clips uh, a bunch of clips together, you know, my favorite lines from some of the interviews, uh, along with music and just sort of put it out into the world, um, just to, you know, see, to generate a little buzz. I think I was trying to show it to folks and see if I get people interested. And um, I had interviewed the band leader of Spanglish Fly, who was one of these new Boogaloo bands that was doing their thing in New York and, and having little gigs and, you know, trying to keep the sound alive. And he knew the programmer who did Summer Stage, uh, Erica Elliott, mm. and he shared it with her. And she contacted me pretty soon after and was like, I love what, what I saw. Do you think you'll have a film ready by the summer, even like a shorter film? It doesn't have to be like a full feature. And, you know, because we'd like to plan a concert alongside the film. That's something they like to do. And he was like, and, you know, of course, at the time, I was nowhere near ready to do anything like that, but it was about eight, nine months out. And I said, yeah, no problem. We'll, we'll, we'll put it together, of course, because it, it sounded too good to be true, because I knew having something I could then film for the, for the documentary where we actually show people coming out and supporting 
this music in, in the modern day would be a great asset to the project because it would help you know show that there is still interest and people still care about this music and that it still has value and deserves to be recognized and, and it would just be cool to have live performances um so of course you know took us till the i think four in the morning the day before the concert to finish a rough cut of the film um i had nothing cleared none of the archival was cleared so we had watermarks all over the place but we screened it that day was like an early 40 something minute version of some of the early parts that you see in the film um and then and then the concert happened um and it was cool you know through that well i'm gonna cut it i'm gonna jump ahead to another i know you have another question where you reference bobito but it was through erica elliott who shared the clips with bobito and that was how i initially started talking to him um and mm. he we did an interview and he uh he ended up um, narrating the project, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I'll I'll leave it till your question. No, 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 that's Bobby fine. No, no, go ahead. no, no, go ahead. No, that was a question um, I, I had. Um, people, people, tell us more about Bobito for people who don't know. Yeah, uh, Bobito Garcia, um, cucumber slice. He's kind of this legendary uh, DJ from New York who had the Stretch and Bobito show, which for all the like. Uh, hip hop heads in the 90s was the show. Um, they broke everyone like Wu-Tang, Biggie, Jay-Z, all these artists got their first radio play on their show. So, you know, when I was in high school, we everyone who liked hip hop would have the tapes and whatever. And so it was, you know, he was to me like this huge celebrity, which to a lot of, maybe not to everyone, but to me, it was like a big deal to get to meet him and, and talk to him and, and get him interested in the project because I had learned that he he was doing a lot of like DJing Latin music and had kind of come to embrace his roots, his Puerto Rican roots, and was really supporting Latin music in New York. Um, so that was sort of how he got involved. And then, yes, you, uh, I think you wanted to know about uh, him going to a high school in Philly. Oh, oh right. I was curious. Like he, he went to Lower Marion High School. I looked it up. I was like, what? <laughs> Yeah, that's like a sub suburban. That's not Philly. That's suburban oh, okay. Philly. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, sort of the, on the fringes of the main lines, like, well, that's not, not hardcore at all. So I was really curious about that. Yeah. So I'll give I'll give um, I'll give Bob's film a plug here. Um, he made an auto autobiographical documentary came out a few years ago called Rock Rubber Soul. Um, and he was somewhat of a like a basketball prodigy, I guess. Mm -hmm. And that's why he went there. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure from what I remember okay. of it was okay. to play ball. Um, he, yeah, he, he like played with the Harlem Globe Trotters. He has a whole basketball story. And the way that connects is because when I first approached him, I said, hey, I'd really love for you to narrate my documentary. He said, oh, well, I've never narrated any, anything before, but I'm working on this documentary about um, street basketball, which came out, uh, it was called Doing It in the Park. And he was like, I kind of want that to be the first thing I narrate it. But if your film comes out after, um, then I'm, I'm down. So I was like, OK, well, let's do an interview in there. So you see him briefly at the end where we actually interview him. And I was like, ah, we can still use a little bit of his interview. But yeah, he ended up narrating the film. And, uh, and you know, I just thought that was a cool way to sort of bridge the generations and um, something we don't address in the film. But I always saw uh, a lot of parallels between early hip hop and, and Boogaloo and Latin soul. Like it felt like a predecessor, mm -hmm. similar, you know, same neighborhoods. Puerto Ricans were heavily involved in early hip hop, hanging out with, you know, their black neighbors, making music to stay out of trouble with limited resources. It felt, you know, felt similar. Um, and so I always like drawing that parallel, um, just, you know, cause things sort of go in cycles and repeat themselves and uh, yeah. I always thought that was a cool part of the Well, story. that's great. Great for, for, for lifting that up and uh, mentioning yeah. it now. Uh, I want to point out that behind, your, behind you, or what we see behind you, is all these album covers of Boogaloo music. That's great. Um, and share with people, we talked a little bit earlier about, because uh, people who make films, documentary films, and all kinds of films, often have problems with music rights and and with the record companies and what was it was that challenging for you with this film yeah um so 
I think had I known more about what I was doing when I started this process, this, this particular project, I probably would have never even tried to do what we ultimately were able to achieve, which was get 38 songs in the film, um, which I, I was talking with a music supervisor who works in Hollywood about that recently, about in relation to a new project I'm working on. And when I told her that, she was like, what? How did you, how? Like, how did you manage that? Because music licensing is as now what they call sync licensing has become one of the primary ways uh, labels, catalogs make money um because people don't really buy music anymore and, and streaming doesn't um you know doesn't pay the bills uh so it can be very challenging to license music basically uh bobby marine who's one of the uh, you know producers uh latin boogaloo music producers and songwriters who, who's featured in the film when i went to meet with him in florida he said well you know i've been doing some things for the people who own fanya now they're a company called codigo he said, why don't I take you down? You come meet them. So I said, all right. I quickly like slapped together a little PowerPoint. I said, right, I'm going to make them a presentation. And essentially we had a handshake agreement that they would let me use the music in the film. And it wasn't until we got into South by Southwest that we said, all right, let's do the contract. Um, and we worked it out with them where it was essentially a, a, a sponsorship partnership. The, the main thing that was key to me was that they would have zero creative control and I'm, I'm still thankful and, and a little bit shocked to this day, but they were cool with that because the original, they, they kind of had nothing to do with the original Fania and the original Fania is sort of a, a character in the story. And there's some conflict around, uh, around how they treated some of these artists and such. And, um, but they were okay. They, I think, you know, they realized that the history is the history. You can't hide from it. Ultimately they want the music out there. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, it was a, yeah, it was, it was like a, a prayer basically that managed to, to come to fruition and, and it worked out that we were able to put all this music in there. Um, so something, I'm, I'm proud of that. Well, along the same lines about, I'm really fascinated by how you explored the, examine the music business. Cause I think people don't know about the economics of the music business uh, and, and, the development of salsa music and tying it to the success of Boogaloo. And, um, and then also how the Boogaloo artists were taken advantage of by the record companies and the, I guess the people that had the clubs. So um, talk a little about, about more about that and even the sort of tension that Maybe it was only temporary between the um, old school, um, what be, well, I guess pre salsa, what would you call it? Um, yeah, the Mambo that, era. Mambo era. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, it's interesting because I, um, uh, John Santos, you maybe know him, as, you know, he's a scholar and community educator and, and musician here. And every year he does a, a class through SF Jazz and also the Museum of the African Diaspora. And he gave a cl class on Puerto Rican music. Uh, and I sort of raised my hand because I was you know, there and said, well, where would you, um, where would you put Boogaloo music? And he was like, well, <laughs> it was like this you know, thing, this sort of trend that, that came and went. And I was like, oh, well, that's kind of, you know, I, I for love and respect that and I was like well that was kind of maybe more kind of <laughs> had more of a bigger role in my life than that mm -hmm. so anyway I, I just sort of did it as a side to to yeah. to how people sort of think of the music I think that's a little telling uh in a way because part of the reason why I made this film was I I was drawn to this sound I love the salsa stuff and, and I dug it and and you know still appreciate all sorts of different types of Latin music but like I sort of said earlier on, when I heard the Boogaloo stuff, I was like, oh, this is clearly New York music. Like there's something, you know, street about this. And that's what drew me to it. And I remember a film came out on PBS that was part of a series, um, but the film itself was called Salsa Music Revolution, I believe. Mm. And it was all about Fania. And I remember they spent about three minutes on Boogaloo and Latin soul or whatever. And they had like a few seconds with Johnny Cologne and a few seconds with Joe Batan. And then they were, oh, that's it. We moved on. And I was like, really? 
really? I felt like that was unfair. And so I said, I set out to say, no, this moment, sure, it wasn't, it wasn't a long period. Maybe it was five years. Um, but this moment deserved something because there's something unique and interesting and really speaks to the Latino experience of growing up in the United States, having a connection to other another country, another language, but also being in the mix, being in the streets, being, you know, part of the community of, of the melting pot. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what, you know, got me interested, but yeah, it, it, it never fit in neatly with Latin music history. And I think that's partly why it kind of just was overlooked. Um, and what you sort of had was this tension when it, when it happened, you had a tension between the folks who considered themselves purists, um, purist to the Afro-Cuban musical tradition, um, which had kind of come to be very revered during the Mambo era. You had people like Tito Puente, um, who were just really like really well-trained, musically trained, classically trained, actually. They were like real musicians. And here you had these young Boogaloo guys who were, um, they, you know, they were just kids who had barely just picked up an instrument for the first time and we're kind of just having fun. And so like these older artists would hear the music and say, oh my God, it's out of tune. It's not in clave, which clave is like the mm -hmm. traditional rhythm for all that, most Latin music, especially Afro-Cuban music. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so they, they, they were hating on it stylistically, musically in that regard. And then, but then what happened when it starts to become really popular mm -hmm. and starts packing the clubs with these younger audiences and sort of the argument we made is maybe the younger audience was never have come in the door in the first place and be there for the whole big salsa movement if it wasn't for Latin Boogaloo. Uh, the, the issue really was that these were young guys who they didn't charge that much or they, they weren't they weren't being offered as much money as some of these bigger, more established artists. So there was a tension there. It's like they're taking away work. They're bringing the rates down. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, as big as some of these guys like Tito Puente and them were at the time, you know, they were still working musicians trying to make a living. Um, so any competition that didn't feel uh, earned, you know, there, there had been, it was very similar to the jazz thing also where you, you know, the tradition was you'd play in a big band, you play in someone else's band for however many years, you'd get your chops, you'd, you know, get your respect, you could pay your dues, and then you could have your own band. But these young Boogaloo guys kind of, they cut in line and people didn't like that. Um, and then I think something I heard, uh, like Felipe Luciano talks about this was, and I always find this ironic because we're talking about Afro-Cuban music, which is African in roots, mm -hmm. but they didn't love the African-American influencing of Latin music. Um, mm -hmm. That was something I heard that some of the purists felt like, well, we don't, you know, yeah, we, you know, we, yeah, we, we, we admit that this music has African roots, but not those African, oh, not okay. those black people. You know what I mean? There was some of that too. Well, wow. um, you know, racism, it always rears its ugly head and there's colorism all, you know, Latinos, we're, we're grappling with that right now. I mean, still, uh, you know, making a place for Afro Latinos and really um, being more inclusive and kind of understanding the dynamic, the racial dynamics within Latino culture. It's not, it's not a monolith, you know, that's one of the things in this country that, you know, there's not a lot of space for uh, different types of folks within that community. Um, so that was kind of one of the issues. Um, and then, uh, and then as things evolved, what, what you see happening is the folks, the young kids who came in, came into the scene, partly because of Boogaloo, because this felt fresh, this felt new, this spoke to them, whereas the older stuff or the more traditional Latin stuff felt like their parents' music, they then start to, and a lot of these bands also were always mixing in more traditional sounds in their own way, trying to bring them in, because they, they did respect the music and these older artists, a lot of them. Um, they weren't necessarily, necessarily trying to ruffle feathers, they were just doing what they thought sounded good. Um, and so you have these young, young folks coming into the scene and taking to Latin music and Kind of paving the way for that audience to to uh embrace salsa mm -hmm. which was um sort of a new term coined uh i believe in the very early 70s um that kind of like encapsulated the latin music sound and at, and at the same time you had movement like the young lords 
um, folks who, uh, you know, were like, like a Latino empowerment movement mm -hmm. alongside the Black power movement. Mm -hmm. And part of that was taking pride in your roots and taking pride in speaking Spanish. So it became like more accepted to listen to music in Spanish and, and more appreciated to the point where it sort of was like, oh, we don't need to do music in English anymore. You know, let's, let's just be true to our roots. So all these things sort of happen. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll let you get to, to I think, so, your next question. No, the question is uh, also about um, with Fania after, Fania Records, was that after Boogaloo or did they, did they, did they record any Boogaloo? Yeah, so Joe Batan was their biggest artist when Fania started. Mm. He was their biggest selling artist. Uh, him and him and Willie Colon were like their biggest selling artists. Um, and then, and like if you listen to the first Fania All Stars record, Joe Batan is on it. Okay. By the second one, he's not. Um, and they were, you know, Ray Barreto, all these artists were doing boogaloo latin soul records in the 60s they all had to some of them did be did, did better than others with it some of them mm -hmm. you could tell they were doing it begrudgingly uh, uh not just fania but folks like tito puente and all, all these artists you know they did their versions their takes on it. eddie palmieri um um but yeah fania fania probably wouldn't have survived without at least in the early years without mm -hmm. some of this crossover type style of music um, and then, you know, the, the, the stage was set, the scene was right, everything came together for Salsa to explode and Fania to be, become the you know, behemoth that it was once uh, the Our Latin Thing film came out and that spread around the world. Right, I remember Our Latin King, that was mm -hmm. 72 or something like 72, 73. Yeah, maybe 70, yeah, yeah it was pretty early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in 71. Um, so in your, in your film, um, people are saying, that there was a conspiracy to get rid of Boogaloo. And, you know, as with conspiracies, you know, there's like people like rumors and, and uh, you know, maybe half truths or no truths. So do you, did you find any really evidence that that really did happen? That um, the record companies and, and I, whoever else would be yeah. part of this conspiracy right. did it? Um, so first, I will just say that everything in the film is anecdotal. You know, I'm, I was just a, a vehicle to document people's views and memories and recollections. Um, and it's, it's interesting because people always, that, that's the one viewpoint that people that tend to remember. But if you watch the film, we actually present multiple viewpoints mm -hmm. um, about what essentially killed Boogaloo. So some of the artists are like, it was assassinated. The industry came after us. They didn't like this sound. They wanted to stop it. Other folks say, well, there were only a few really big hits. You know, like anything would, if it just has a few big hits, it's not going to last. There were other people who said, you know, it, it was a trend. It had its moment and it passed. And my opinion after talking to all these different folks and all the different viewpoints was everyone was right. There was a little bit of everything happening there. Um, yes, it makes perfect sense that you have older, more established artists. And there were a few um, talent managers, basically, at the time who sort of ran things, uh, ran some of the clubs. Um, a gentleman who, who would get talked about a lot was Jose Cubello. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he was like Tito Puente's manager, I believe Eddie Palmieri. But he would also take on these Boogaloo artists because they were hot at the time. And there, there was, I think, some resentment from some of the bigger artists saying, hey, like these guys are taking our, taking, taking our bread and butter, our money. Um, you know, let's give them less gigs. And I think there might have been some truth to that. Um, there's always competition in the music business. It's normal. There's always, um, you know, there's always competition. Um, and competing sounds and then but I also do think like I said previously that Boogaloo kind of paved the way for salsa by getting an audience that maybe previously had been more into soul music kind of um ready their ears ready their ears open to more traditional Latin sounds um but done in like a new fresh way younger way 
Mm -hmm. um, and that's what salsa really was. Salsa was like the New York version of, you know, some of these these more traditional sounds. Mm -hmm. With a what? Go ahead. Sorry. No, that that's it. Go ahead. No, uh, somebody, uh, uh, Dorothea, posted in the in the the chat. Uh, I wanted to know about racism in the music and club business, and that and it's suggesting you know that that's that's part of what was going on too. Yeah, I, I like I said, there there was Felipe Luciano talked about it, how he felt there was this pushback against having any sort of African American influence in Latin music, um, which, like I said, always seemed really ironic. <laughs> Didn't make much sense to me, but you know. Racism doesn't make much sense, period, really, if we think about it. Uh, so the logic, yeah, it, it, it was crazy. But, you know, there's always people trying to hold on to something and say the old way is the right way. This way, we don't like this. This is this is bastardization of what we think is true and, and great, you know? So that that's that's always going to happen. And, and I do think race played a part in that, um, mm. for sure. Yeah, and I'm sort of reflecting back um, when you said about the Mambo era that there was in New York, there was a, you know, a Jewish night, a Black American night, Latin night. I was trying to wrap my head around what that would look like and how that would operate. You know, it's like, oh, no, oh, um, no, you, right. you want to come back? <laughs> yeah. You want to come back tomorrow? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was, yeah. Segregation was, is New York's very I, i've come to kind of like think about it a lot but it is still a very segregated place you know um and i don't doubt it it was way worse then right right um, yeah uh i i really uh, like the um it, the part of the film where you have uh, johnny cologne talking about the music center and uh, cultural center that he had and and bringing up um, a young man who really wanted to be part of it and and who, who turned out to be Mark Anthony who's like the isn't he the biggest um salsa star or even sold the most salsa records of anybody ever yeah it's so, definitely one of the one of the biggest yeah so it's great that they could take that generational yeah his, and he wasn't the only one there are a lot of folks who went through Johnny's school um who, who uh, will talk about it a lot of um people still you know out there playing some of the some of the biggest players um went through his school and i think later taught at his school um he he did something special there with that and uh you know he he uh he he felt um like i think he didn't get his due in the music industry but his contribution you know deserves to be recognized even just with the school, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, I got, um, thanks Elizabeth, uh, pointed out there was a question in the Q&A, which I didn't notice, but I'll read it. Uh, do you think that salsa might get caught in the trap of the narrative of the US as a melting pot, homogenizing the various and many varieties of music from each nation in Latin America? What do you think of that? Um, well, what I sort of see happen with salsa was the term, the concept originated in New York, but was pretty quickly reabsorbed back into like the much larger Latin America, uh, like all of Latin America kind of embraced it. Um, and, and so yes, it reflects a whole bunch of different styles and sounds. Um, and that was sort of why it was called salsa because it's like this sauce you know we're putting everything mm. in the sauce mm. um that's sort of my understanding of how they even the name like it was a joke at first it wasn't even supposed to be a genre uh, um kind of like jazz like people just it was just one of these words people started using and then it came to define it but i, I you know i i have to say like i said when i was a little kid i had no idea salsa was a new york thing i thought it was from latin america i said this is like music from somewhere else that was mm. what I thought, mm. you know, hip hop, that's New York or like okay. you know, or <laughs> punk or whatever, you know, whatever you want to, you know, there were other genres that I, I thought of as part of New York. But it, it, so I, I just thought it was cool to, you know, just remind people that, hey, there was a moment in time when these things happened 
and New York was a part of it, you know, and it's not taken away from, from any of the contributions uh, that came before or after. Mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, yeah, you'll see, I mean, there's salsa records from all over the world now beyond Latin America. I mean, it's, it's huge in Japan. It's, you, you know, all, all over different parts of Europe too. Um, mm -hmm. So folks, you know, it, it's, and then there's the dance culture, which is its own, probably even bigger than the music really, mm -hmm. which is something I've come to learn about. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think, you know, New York has its place in that history and it's my hometown. So, uh, I, you know, I like, of course I was going to focus on that, but, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that should take away at all. From okay. I want to read you a comment from someone who says, um, I'm from living in Berkeley. I grew up in Harlem during that period of time, danced to the music all my teenage years. Great memories. Thank you. So, Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, that's been one of the best things about making this film, just how many people have like been like, thank you. You took me back. I watched this with my father and we cried. And, you know, like that always makes me feel good. I can bring, you know, bring bridge generations, bring people together. Um, and this experience of Latinos trying to find their identity or just the immigrant experience or anyone coming from anywhere else, that's just an ongoing thing. It's a constant thing in this country. And, um, you know, people want to, one thing with the with the Latino experience is I always felt like there wasn't always enough acknowledgement of the history, um, like like you know oh these are just recent arrivals you know and I'm like well, people been here you know been here com contributing to the history to the culture for a long time. So is there um, anything else you want to say about this, this film before I ask you about your current project? Um, Let's see. No, I think I think we really uh, we covered everything. I'm just like I said, I'm just, you know, it's happy. It makes me happy to see the film still have a life seven years later that people are still coming to it and appreciating it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, yeah, it makes me happy. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah I think people are happy too. <laughs> I mean, having seen the movie and everything. So what's your current project that you're working on? Um, you know what really quickly i do okay. want to just say one thing um a lot of folks never got to see the short film i made after we like it like that with uh red bull um about eddie palmieri and harlem river drive so i just want to uh throw that out there it's available on youtube it's available uh through red bull tv if you go to their website but you can find it on youtube it's called eddie palmieri a Re revolution on harlem river drive um, I kind of see it as a companion piece to the film because he was one of the few one of the few artists I really wanted to get in We Like It Like That and we couldn't at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I got to spend a few weeks with him working on this film and he's just such a legend and that album is sort of a continuation of the story of Boogaloo. It was more of a Latin funk album. It was about um, like he was being influenced by the Young Lords mm -hmm. and the Black Panthers. And so he had Aretha Franklin's backing band join him to make this record and it, it really like i think continues the story a little bit so just wanted to throw that out there is this something you could put in the chat or oh yeah find out about it? yeah I'll, I'll do that once uh once yeah I'll do that i got it again. i'll put it in the chat oh, oh, okay. Got it. okay great okay. so uh, yeah i i did i have a question about what about updates on the people in the film because the film came out five six years ago so as some of the folk i was curious what, what some of the other the, the main characters in the film are doing yeah so joe batan he's still out there he's still still doing his thing he's still performing he comes out west he does shows all over the place so he's someone you can definitely catch we got pete rodriguez to to do a few things uh but he kind of receded back into mm -hmm. his you know i think that's what where he was happy was you know laying low and enjoying mm -hmm. his his life as a i think grandfather maybe great grandfather at this mm -hmm. point um johnny cologne uh i'm not i imagine he's still doing his thing um you know uh unfortunately a few of the artists passed away even before the film came out mm -hmm. um so like joey pastrana jimmy sabater who were in the film which was you know you just you just feel really blessed to like have the opportunity to talk to someone and then how you know and so i always uh, I'm grateful for that. And unfortunately, Larry Harlow passed away last year. Mm. Um, but uh, Harvey's still out, you know, doing his thing. I, I've 
I've heard things that he's compiling music from his, his old late label, Coco, unreleased stuff mm. to be put out. And uh, a lot of younger artists have, you know, connected with folks like him and some of these other guys. And um, so, you know, if anyone needs to talk to anyone, I'm happy to, you know, not, not just to talk, but if you got if you got some work for them or something, you know, uh, something good, uh, you know, happy to always try and help facilitate so t- that. Tell us how to do that. To get yeah, there. just um, I guess you can reach me. I guess a good way through my website, uh, mrwdirects.com. Um, that'll probably be the easiest way for folks to just send me an email. Okay. Um, I believe that's how you guys got in touch with me. Yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, I just want to say quickly before we run out of time, you were asking about my my latest yeah, work. Right. Um, so six years ago, I moved to Oakland. Uh, I was a diehard New Yorker, still am at heart, uh, but. Uh, married a California girl and you know she sort of let me know said well if you want to start a family let's go try living in California for a little bit so I came out here she's got peoples here and uh kind of early on I read about this cannabis equity program here and it was the first place in the country to do it so half of the permits for legal cannabis businesses here are reserved for people who've either been uh convicted of a weed crime or live in districts that were um heavily targeted by police. So primarily black and Latino communities here in Oakland. Um, And at the time, this was sort of a radical concept. Um, But now anywhere that legalizes, they're either in the process of implementing or debating or trying to put together equity programs. Um, But Oakland's was way ahead. So early on in the process, I started kind of just trying to connect with folks who were involved in it. And, uh, and, uh, I felt this was an important story. And I've always done things outside of the music stuff. Like I said, my background was initially in journalism. So it wasn't like a big leap for me to start doing this. But I, I did, you know, want to expand my range beyond just music documentary. Um, and so hopefully uh, we're trying to finish it this summer. Um, and uh, we'll see. Hopefully it will uh, it'll make a splash. It's called and- Weed Dreams. We dreams great, and yeah. um, since the Congress did vote mm. to mm-hmm. legalize uh, cannabis, maybe it'll come out at a, a time when we can have our <laughs> fingers crossed that you know it'll be not just state by state, but also yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's there's a lot of operators who are dreading that day, mm. so <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see how that all shakes out. Um, because okay. well, say a little bit more about that before we go. Um, there's there's positive aspects. I think to people might be allowed to bank, which is a big problem. Mm-hmm. Um, credit, can, you know, credit banking, um, the issues around insurance, all these can be complicated because it's it's federally, it's not legal federally. Mm-hmm. But I think there's also a fear that once it's federally legal, the really really big companies like you know your big huge tobacco companies and such will feel it's time. I think they're already sort of positioning themselves to come in. So there is a fear that any, you know, that the mom and pops and and stuff are gonna, are gonna be the first to go. So we'll see what happens. That that'll be a whole other project. (laughs) That's really interesting. Given uh, tobacco uh, companies have um, actually done a lot of harm, maybe they should be, Mm -hmm. you know, prevented from getting involved but yeah that's well, me. <laughs> i mean and and in a way the con- whole concept of, of equity is is an attempt to you know say well who who deserves to profit from this mm-hmm. you know who who's been harmed by the war on drugs um it's certainly not these you know rich ceos but if nothing is done they're going to be the ones who are most likely to benefit mm-hmm. even even in the cannabis space as it is just statewide it's mm-hmm. like the, the people who own all the businesses, it's, it's something like 95% white owned. Um, mm-hmm. And that's not who was getting arrested. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, thank you, Matthew, for this conversation. Thank you. Yeah. And, and best of luck on your, um, what was it called? We, we Dream? Yes, you got it. We Dreams. Yeah. And we'll be looking forward to that. All right. Thank okay. you. All right. Appreciate it. Sure. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you, Cornelius, and thank you, Matthew, for that conversation and for your really, truly beautiful film, Matthew. I really loved it, and I'm so glad that we were able to share it with our audience. 
Um, so thank you thank everyone you. for joining us today. Um, I do want to alert you that African Diaspora Film Club will have a special edition next month with a different time and date. Um, so please join us on Saturday, not Sunday, but Saturday, May 7th at 12 noon when Cornelius will be in conversation with Dr. Sheila S. Walker about three of her short films on the diaspora in Latin America. Um, and you can learn more about those three short films and register for the program on MOAD's website. I did put the link in the chat earlier, but you can just go to our website calendar to find information about it. Um, MOAD's also currently open to the public. We have three beautiful new exhibitions that just opened this week. So if you're a local or are traveling to the Bay Area, please come and see us at our location in downtown San Francisco. We would also appreciate if you take a few minutes to fill out an online survey about today's program. I also put the link in the chat, but it should pop up when you leave this webinar. Um, so take a minute to fill that out. And we're also offering an incentive these days. So you might win a $25 gift certificate to the Moad bookstore if you fill out the survey. Um, and of course, we would love for you to support the museum in any way. Become a member, give us a small donation, give us your house, whatever you can do. Um, and especially, I want to thank Black Public Media for partnering with us and for supporting this program. Um, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their Sunday, and we'll see you again next month. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank, thank you, you, Matthew. So Bye. Thank you. Bye.